So I am thrilled today to introduce you to our guest, Allison Tedford Seaweed. Allison is a Quag Youth First Nation member and a consultant who offers advice in communication and Indigenous relations and is the author of the Canadian Business Owner's Guide to Reconciliation. She has spent the last two decades working in Indigenous inclusion in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Moderating this conversation today is journalist Kylie Adair. Kylie is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in the Globe and Mail, Broadview Magazine, Future of Good, and more. She also works as a communications consultant with social purpose organizations and focuses all of her storytelling on social and economic justice. Welcome, both of you. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, and thank you to KNWCC for hosting this event and, and for having me moderate. i um, really, really excited to be here. I'm joining this conversation today actually as a visitor on Mikusuki and Seminole land um, down here in Florida. I'm visiting family and, and really grateful to be able to join this conversation from this land. Um, so, and welcome, Allison. Um, really looking forward to, to diving into this conversation with you as well. Thank you so much, Kylie Gillikasla. Um, I am joining from uh, the traditional and ceded territories of the um, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, um, what's colonially known as Vancouver. Uh, my community's territories are uh, far from here, but our family um, has, I think I'm second, my son is third generation born in Vancouver proper. Um, so these are lands that I have a deep connection to and love for. Um, I'm grateful to be joining you today and also thinking of my colleagues from the TSSU union with SFU who are on the picket line today as part of the uh, work stoppage uh, as we look to get equitable grad student compensation, something that is important to encourage Indigenous opportunities of access and support for education. So, um, but I'm very grateful to be here with you today and to be able to have this important conversation and, and to be in the presence of such dynamic and impressive women. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks, Allison. And thanks for that acknowledgement as well. Um, and first things first, congratulations on the publication of your book earlier this year. Um, I read it, obviously, in preparation for this conversation, and it's fantastic. It is so um, useful and practical and also um, just very clear that it came from your heart. Um, so just thank you for that for that contribution to the world. Um, and I guess we can start sort of there at the beginning. What what was the need for this book? Why did you write it? Why did you sit down and, and put all of these thoughts on paper? Um, well, Indigenous inclusion has been something that's been kind of in my heart and part of my career for the last you know, 20 years. But after the gravesite confirmations into chem loops, I had a lot of people who were reaching out to me on social media and looking for advice about um, how they can be supportive and if if it's appropriate for them to be speaking to what was happening and and if it was what what should they say and what can they do and how can they be involved and I just wanted to be able to provide a resource to help you know guide the big hearts and um, thoughtful people who were looking to create change uh, as a result of of all of this um, coming more into light and more into the public conversation. So it's hoping to be helpful to business owners and provide something that was digestible and actionable and hopefully um, helpful in, in their journey. Yeah, I mean, I think you've achieved that goal, but what is it that that business owners are sort of you know, if you had to distill it, what are they most unsure of, or what do, what do they most sort of need guidance on as they sort of enter this um, this space of reconciliation? I think people are really looking at like, well, what can I do? Um, you know, particularly like from a small business perspective, you know, I don't have a budget of Apple or Google, but how am I going to make a difference? You know, I don't hire a lot of people. How can I be part of this? Uh, and also, um, you know, what do I say and um, how do I reach out and what happens if I say the wrong thing as I'm, I'm doing that and how can I, how can I move forward 
um, what do I need to know in order to do that? And um, kind of where do where do we go from here? And and is this even a place where I should be, or should I be, you know, passing the mic or, um, you know, staying out of things? So um, that's those tend to be the areas really kind of like where is my lane and where can I go and what what should I do and how can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and you say sort of like there's this um, there's this question of of where is your lane? And I think there is a particular lane, and this is what I've learned from your book. There is a particular lane for for business owners, um, and it's not you know one lane. It's many different lanes, and it's in many different spheres, but. You you sort of write about um, the relationship between business and between and colonization and and you quote um, at one point you quote Professor Matt Murphy in saying business has often been really at the point of the spear of colonization um, and so yeah I was hoping you could elaborate on that that connection between business and our economic systems and and colonization certainly I mean over time there has been a lot of you know exploitation of our earthly gifts and traditional territories um there um you know have been challenges in working together in a good way um that you know respect the needs of of communities and also that create meaningful and sustainable benefits uh, for communities and then also kind of looking at the systems that have kept indigenous entrepreneurs um, from being able to fully participate in the same way that other businesses have. And, and by default, that meant that there's, you know, um, there have been challenges in having uh, as much of a competitive advantage uh, when over time there have been, you know, legal structures that have been in the way. Things like um, farmers not being able to sell their crops to non-Indigenous people or restrictions around who can have what kinds of permits. And there were all sorts of structures that have gotten in the way of the ability to create generational wealth and things that are supportive of today's entrepreneurs who would like to be able to create um, businesses and opportunities within their own communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually just doing some writing this morning um, for a, a client in the social finance world and and was um, someone had asked this question of like, how much do we know about the Indian Act and how it interacts with business owners and access to finance and, you know, the Indian Act limits um, what Indigenous communities can use their property as collateral for loans. Um, and so like things like this that we we don't often think about that really make it a different sort of experience. Um, but the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in 2015, um, their report called on Canadian business owners to, to act on all of this and to do something about it. Um, and there's a specific call to action, number 92, that you write about in the book. And for anyone who may be unfamiliar with this call to action, would you just sort of give us a brief overview of, of what it asks of us? For sure. So call to action 92 calls on business owners to provide um, education um, within their organizations. Uh, it calls on businesses to create opportunities um, to respect like, UNDRIP and the you know free prior informed consent of communities. Um, it it's basically about you know creating opportunities, creating sustainable um, benefits, and 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 informing and educating the people that are working in your business so that. They're, they can interact uh, in good faith with communities and also to create an environment where Indigenous people want to work and feel can thrive um, and be successful. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely uh, a good overview of some of the things that are, are helpful and, and it definitely speaks to, you know, that there is a role, the, the TRC specifically identified the role of, of business and reconciliation. And so if you're feeling like, should I be here? If you own a business, then then yes, this is this is absolutely something that you're you're a part of and and some ideas as to how to move forward have been provided. So that's good news to have a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And one thing you talk a lot about in the book, and the TRC doesn't necessarily touch on it, but that's because it's so broad 
ranging their report. Um, but one thing you talk a lot about is the need for businesses to do a lot of internal work and, and sort of look inward before they sort of go into communities or practice reconciliation externally. Um, what does that inward looking internal work look like? Um, and why is it so important for businesses to engage in? I try to think about it like a dinner party. Like if you're going to invite people over to your house to have dinner, you're going to make sure that you have like chairs for everybody and you have plates and cutlery, you know, if your guests have dietary restrictions or, you know, things that they need in order to be comfortable. Um, and in the same way, if you're going to be inviting people into your business, then it's good to be mindful of like, is your space ready to receive um, new staff and um, are you equipped to meet the needs of the new people that you're inviting into your organization? So really looking at like, what are your policies like? Are they designed with a specific type of employee in mind? Would they meet the needs of indigenous families? Um, looking at how are you, how have you been talking about what you do? And is that accessible and relatable to Indigenous people? Um, do the things that you offer, um, like, is it accessible? Um, do people know about it? Are you in the spaces where Indigenous people are going to be learning about your business and have some familiarity with it? And really, like, is your workspace ready? Do your staff know about, um, like, do they have cultural competence? Are they... Uh, equipped to be welcoming new employees and um, to be able to create a space where everyone really wants to be there because it's one thing to recruit but you, you know if you don't if you recruit without thinking about the retention then you have a situation where you may be bringing people in for harm uh, and that's not going to ultimately serve you for relationships with the community if if their community members are joining your organization and having a difficult experience um, and then also, I mean, if, if you really have a heart for inclusion, wanting to welcome people, then, you know, people being harmed is not something that you're aligned with anyways, and, and not something that's intended. Um, so really taking the time to make sure that you're ready to receive all of the people is really um, helpful, just so that when they arrive, it's a great experience. And, and you can do what it is that you set out to do, which is to create opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll just acknowledge quickly, um, Lilia is putting in some questions into the chat, um, and these are reflection points that are um, directly from Allison's book. So these are questions she asks the reader throughout, um, and we're hoping that they'll help you reflect throughout this conversation on what we're talking about. And please feel free to add your, your responses right in the chat. We'd love to, to get a conversation going. Um, and Allison, you talk about the idea of unintended harm. Um, um, and, you know, maybe having these intentions to do good and build relationships with Indigenous communities um, and with Indigenous staff, but in the process of that actually causing harm. Um, can you, yeah, and I, I think this was a, a theme throughout the book as well of, of the potential for reconciliation efforts to sort of reinforce that power dynamic um, and those colonial dynamics. And could you just share more about that and what's the sort of risk there and, and how how does that go wrong? How does that reconciliation work go wrong? Well, I think if you're looking to be doing work in communities uh, that you are hoping to will be supportive of what communities need, it's really important to find out from their perspective what their needs are instead of solving the problems that you think that you see when you're looking at how a community works. Um, because sometimes the gaps aren't what what people from the outside might see, right? Things that you think might be a problem may not actually be a problem. And there might be other issues that would be, you know, welcome to have support. Um, but when when you come in and tell people how they should be doing things um, in an effort to be helpful, that can really recreate dynamics of, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people show up and tell us <laughs> how we should be doing things. And, and that's kind of how we got here. So we wanna do the opposite of that which is to listen to people and find out what it is that they need and how we can be supportive. And then later when we're talking about, you know, the great things that we've done in partnership, thinking about like ethical impact storytelling, how are you sharing the story? How does the way you're sharing the story respect the strengths that these communities bring to the table as you're solving problems together? You know, is it uh, like a collaboration or is it a rescue mission? 
And those, the way that you position the story of the work that you've done together can really, you know, impact your relationship with the community, right? Depending on how you've um, portrayed um, their, their situation, their community, their strengths. Um, and, and it's just good to be mindful that if you want to maintain a good relationship, that, that we think about the way we talk about our partners, even when well-intentioned, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and so learning to apply it, you know, a strength-based lens and looking at kind of the narratives that are used when we talk about um, the contributions that are being made uh, in community and, and really being, being mindful of that in order to preserve those relationships. Right. Avoiding that, that white savior narrative, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's tons of really practical information about how exactly to do that um, in the book. Um, but sort of more broadly, what, you know, recognizing that every business owner is different, every business owner on this call is vastly different, has different experiences and backgrounds and type of business that they they do. Um, but are there skills or attributes that come really naturally to the entrepreneurial personality that business owners can kind of lean on when they're engaging in reconciliation work? Um, and as an example, I thought it was really um, poignant in the book when, um, you know, someone you interviewed, her name's uh, Nicole Marcia, and she's the director of teacher training at a, an organization called Yoga Outreach. Um, talks about having a growth mindset and embracing this idea of continual learning and how that comes really naturally to entrepreneurs and can, can be applied in this reconciliation work as well. Um, but yeah, is there, if you wanted to expand on that or, or what other kind of skills and attributes come naturally to entrepreneurs that they can use here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I tend to use the growth mindset when I talk to people about it in terms of like, okay, so you don't, maybe you don't have a huge budget or maybe you don't have a big team or, you know, maybe you don't have as many resources as you would like to, to be able to contribute to these efforts, but what can you do now? And um, what can you plan for and for the future? And kind of how can you move towards where you want to be? Really, um, one of um, my former clients used the expression all or something um, instead of all or nothing, which I really appreciate. Um, so that's, that's kind of one strength that I see. The other strength is that, you know, setting out to build better relationships in community um, and, you know, meeting new people, trying to make change in a way you haven't before, like that can be a little bit scary and intimidating, right? But entrepreneurs are brave. You're out there starting a whole thing out of nothing, right? That's, that's brave. It's brave to be like, I'm going to do this thing. And I'm hoping that people are going to believe in my idea and my skills. Right. So you can bring that brave to the table, too. And 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 the discomfort of learning new things and just know that, you know, you've already done something really brave in, in establishing your business. And then also looking at, well, when was the last time you expanded your services? Right. To either meet a different client profile or to fill a different need. Like, what did you do to do that? Right. You took some time to get to know the people you were going to help. You took some time to look around at like what other people are doing in the space. You looked at what's needed and, and you talked to people to find out the best way to, to implement that in your business. And that's exactly what, what you're doing here in terms of identifying what are, what are the needs in community? What are the ways that you can meet them? What else are people doing? What, what can, how can you make that your own? Right. So I think that's another piece. And you know, I think another strength is, you know, anti-fragility in, in terms of like, you know, there's going to be criticism um, um, in running a business. You know, not everyone will like exactly how you're going to do things. Um, some people might not be on board hearing that you are hoping to participate in reconciliation. Some people think it's not needed, right? There's going to be people who are maybe not going to be on board and being able to hear the feedback and do the thing that you believe is right and not um you know let it destroy you or is really important that's a skill that you know as business owners we we have to practice all the time um and then also the anti-fragility in terms of like learning something new and you know sometimes we need to be corrected um, and we get more information about what it is that we're we're doing to help us guide future efforts and being able to take that in the spirit it's intended 
not take it personally as an attack, but like accept it as a gift of love uh, mm -hmm. and, and be able to move forward from there. I love that. I've never heard of this concept of anti-fragility, um, you know, as it's practiced in other spaces as well, right? Um, as opposed to just in this sort of reconciliation space, like we practice anti-fragility all the time um, as business owners. Um, and so, yeah, bringing that into this work, like why wouldn't it be something we we can do? Um, yeah, and I really love that all or something. Um, yeah, that's so um, Balance 365 is a wellness company for women. Uh, and that's one of their, their slogans, which I really, really love. And um, Amber Rogers was the person that who gave me teachings around anti-fragility in one of her Facebook groups that was uh, around um, food and wellness. Um, and I brought that into my work. Amazing, so empowering. Um, and then sort of on the the kind of flip side of this, are there attributes or skills or things that don't necessarily come naturally to entrepreneurs? Again, recognizing everyone's different, but I'm thinking of things like, you know, patience and understanding that things take time and you can't just go out and get everything done that you want to do. Um, and things need to, you know, things that really matter take time and move at the speed of relationships or, yeah, are there, is there anything else that kind of comes maybe unnaturally to entrepreneurs that they may need to sort of work through as they as they do at reconciliation work. Yeah, I mean, I think that patience is definitely something, right? I know we always get like super enthusiastic. We want to do the thing and we want to move fast and build things and, you know, create an immediate impact. Um, but we sometimes need to wait and move at the speed of trust with these communities and make sure that we're building things in a way where everyone feels comfortable which can take time. And also, I mean, the reality is there, you know, communities that you want to work with might have other priorities, um, other things that are happening that maybe weren't planned um, that need to be handled in a way that's cultural and within protocol. So things might be delayed because of, you know, a death in the community or, um, you know, seasonal ceremony or any number of things. So, really having to work with somebody else's timelines and um, and wait sometimes when we really don't necessarily want to wait um, can be a challenge. And then, I mean, I think as entrepreneurs, like we're, we're used to kind of like making our own rules and creating our own things. And, and, uh, and I love that about us. <laughs> um, and then at the same time, when we're working with communities, we have to look at like, what are the, the protocols that guide relationships within within community what are the things that um, need to be present and need to be done that maybe we're not used to doing because that's not our way of doing things but that we need to follow in order to show respect uh, so so like there's definitely kind of having to contend with other people's processes that we may not necessarily be familiar with or we may not understand and we depending on the rationale like and, and where it's coming from, we may not even get a fulsome explanation, right? Because there are some things that are discussed, uh, you know, externally, and there's some things that are just discussed internally. So there may be aspects that won't be shared, and there needs to be comfort and trust, um, and that everyone's doing what they can with what they have, um, and that the information that's intended for you is, is being provided, and, and to be able to move forward from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that humility aspect as well, right? Like not everyone wants to work with you or not everyone will provide explanations for things that you or questions you might have um, and being okay with that, that part of the journey as well. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to folks, if you have questions for Allison, we will have an opportunity for you to come off of mute and ask her um, directly. But if you'd rather put them in the chat, I will bring them into this conversation right now as well. Um, and we did have one pre-submitted um, audience question. So someone submitted this when they registered. Um, and I think it's a really good sort of practical question. Um, they ask, what can I do to make my organization's Truth and Reconciliation Day social media posts do more than pay lip service to the Indigenous community. Um, and 
I think, you know, this is something you write about um, in the book, Alison, this idea of performativity and um, the difference between really meaningful and intentional reconciliation and performative or lip, serv lip service work. Um, and yeah, what are those differences to you and what can organizations do to move toward the meaningful, intentional side of things? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to think about, like, what are you hoping to achieve out of this when, and what would be meaningful? Uh, you know, it's it's good to acknowledge the day, but um, how can you make that count? So um, what would be helpful? So how can you mobilize people to learn more um, so that they can participate in their own journey? How can you let people know about what's happening in communities so they can show up and join um, and be part of what's happening? Uh, how can you mobilize people to direct resources towards causes um, that are important? So how do you educate about what um, charitable organizations would be good to support or what ways people can contribute to different organizations? Um, and how can you pass the mic? So what kinds of organizations are doing work in the space who maybe have a smaller following um, that would benefit from being able to reach your audience? So how can you create space for people within the structure? Because you know, we trust that these channels and these platforms that we built are, are going to be, you know, big enough to support our business needs. And that's why we, like, we invest in them. So how can we trust those same systems to help us advance the things that we care about? Um, so really looking at, like, what do you have available? What can you contribute? Do you have a newsletter? Do you have your social channels? Do you have, you know, as planned speaking engagements around the time frame? And what would you like people to do um, if you could ask anybody to do something that would count? Um, and, and how can you integrate that you know, in order to be able to um, create meaningful change with the actions that you take? Mm. Would it be fair to say, like, if the only thing you're doing is a social media post, that's maybe not the way to go about it? Like your social media post needs to be based on some learning or something, some other action that's taken place? I think that you know, it's a really good first step to be acknowledging um, what's what's happening and to mark the day and to show respect for the people who are grieving. Um, I think it's even better to be able to tie it to, to a meaningful action or a next step. Sometimes we don't know what that is. And that's mm. valid too, right? That's part of the listening is that maybe the next step is finding out what the next step is, right? Maybe that's engaging with a consultant to look at how you can do things differently. Um, maybe it's taking the time to, to find out what would be most helpful so that you're not going in with something that is, you know, maybe going to be harmful or have the opposite impact. So if, if it's just a thing on the content calendar and it's not something that you really care about, um, then, you know, that's something to reflect on for yourself. Um, but I always encourage people to take the first step. And, you know, even if it's just a social post, because that might be all you have available, right? And that might be where you're at right now. And then you can plan for something else next year. And it, and it doesn't stop being relevant October 1st, right? This is a practice that happens all year. So maybe part of the journey is taking your audience along with you as you're learning. Right? How can you share in what you're learning and learn out loud with people so that they can be encouraged and to normalize that it's okay not to know everything, right? And it's okay to acknowledge that you're not an expert and you're finding things out. I'm finding things out. I learn things all the time, right? And that's that's okay. So I think um, whatever we can do to normalize, you know, taking the time to learn more, whether it starts with the social post or it starts with something bigger, um, that's that's going to vary based on what you have available and gratitude for anybody who's doing anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Toby writes in the chat, um, maybe once we've done something, we can push ourselves to do something more. And I like that idea of momentum and starting with something and, and knowing that that's only the beginning. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's identifying, it's taking a stand for what it is that you believe in. And that's a way that you can hold yourself accountable. And then you're, and also for your audience to be able to know what it is that you're, is what matters to you. 
right? And then, you know, then you have people who might be checking in to see how things are going. And that can be really exciting. It gives you lots of opportunities to talk about the things that you have planned and to invite people in to be co-conspirators in, in doing good and better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And speaking of this idea of, of learning and embracing that continual learning, um, we also have a question from Avery. Um, she writes, speaking of consultants, um, do you, Allison, have tips on finding one to help you do this work? Yeah, I mean, I would look at the um, Canadian Council of Aboriginal Businesses. They have listings of um, of consultants who would be, um, depending on what it is that you're looking for, um, might be able to help you with either um, learning and development or reconciliation action planning uh, or and, and taking a look at what it is that you're doing and where you might be able to go. So um, those are some some good options. And then also talk to other people in your industry, find out who has a really strong understanding of what it is that you do and um, what ways can be, um, you know, helpful in terms of um, things that you're already doing. Because I think it's it's important to, to understand that, like, you don't have to, like, reinvent the wheel and create a whole other thing in order to participate. Like, you can do things within the scope of what you're already doing whether that's bringing in new Indigenous suppliers, uh, whether that's, you know, looking at, uh, you know, what software you're using, you know, what any number of factors, right, that don't have to create new infrastructure necessarily or new offers or new, like, um, so that's kind of where where I would suggest, suggest looking is talk to your peers look at the uh, Canada Council for Aboriginal Businesses and, and also um, spend some time talking to other people who've worked successfully with a, with a good consultant who's going to be a good fit for your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think from reading your book, I know the answer to this question that also came up in the chat, which is find people you can pay to do this work for you. Um, but Toby asks, can you speak to the importance of people doing their own work and education without relying on our Indigenous colleagues or partners to, in quotes, teach us? Yes. So something I encourage is um, respect for scope of practice. So if you've hired an Indigenous employee and um, he runs the forklift, um, he is not necessarily the person who needs to educate all of your staff about colonization, unless that is somehow also part of the work description that you hired him for, or he really likes it and that's his thing and he would like to do that. But the presence of an Indigenous employee should not, like, they it should not be assumed that they are now the learning and development answer to educating your staff, it can be really uncomfortable. Not everybody will feel like maybe they're um, prepared to do that education. It's also um, emotionally like laborious. Um, so if somebody's job isn't to do that, then they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be expected to be doing that um, without compensation. Um, and without a conversation around boundaries, like what is what are they comfortable with? What is the scope that they're willing to engage? And how can these learning opportunities be structured so that everybody is well taken care of and that um, everybody feels comfortable? Um, because, yeah, it's um, and, you know, don't underestimate the power of Google, right? There's some things that we can there's a lot of think pieces that have been written. There's lots of books out there. There's lots of um, movies and podcasts and other media that you can pursue that can help um, you learn about different things um, that you're curious about. And taking the time to seek out, you know, published survivor stories means that you don't have to ask intrusive questions of survivors that you meet because you're wanting to learn more about the experience. It's better to seek out what is being offered than um, to be in a situation where someone might feel that like people are prying into their, their personal experience, which might be deeply traumatic. Um, and so just creating that space where you already have, you know, architecture, right? Like just so that you people aren't doing what they didn't intend to do and like that can be really uncomfortable to be like I got this great job oh now I'm the department of questions about indigenous people and purchasing right like 
That's not what anybody signed up for. And they shouldn't have to do more work than other employees for the same money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this, you know, this wasn't a question I had planned to ask you and it's kind of a big one. So apologies, <laughs> but, but you, you talk about the idea of like prying questions and, and that potentially being really traumatizing. And I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people might not think about the work they do in like the worlds of business and entrepreneurship and finance and all of this as needing to be trauma informed. Um, but I, it, I'm sure it does. And so what what would be sort of your perspective on, on trauma informed entrepreneurship um, and being in those spaces in a trauma informed way? I mean, I think it's important to think about like what might people's experiences have been with um you know, I mean, thinking about like human resources, like what might their experiences have been around um, enforcement of rules and policy uh, or um, having to ask for things that are different than other people or being in situations where they might have to disclose, you know, wrongdoing and there are power structures to consider you know, thinking about, you know, even, even purchasing and thinking about, well, okay, so um, the policy is, you know, payment in 30 days, but, you know, somebody lost the invoice and it's been three months and then someone's going to mail a check and then the bank's going to hold it. And, you know, there's multiple generations that are being supported by this payment um, so really thinking about like what how does that feel and what does it feel like to be in that place of of scarcity or are having an unmet uh, commitment uh, and really thinking about like what what can be the impact on that person and and just reflecting on what might someone's experiences have been you know um, there have been examples in media around like people's experiences with banking right and attempting to open a bank account and and all of these these pieces or if you're requiring people to bring sick notes think about what was somebody's might be someone's experience with healthcare right how often have they been believed when they go to the doctor's office and you're asking them to submit something um and or if you're limiting the number of times someone can see a doctor is that based on the average number of times it takes someone to solve a problem when people believe them and how might that meet the needs of people who don't have that experience, who haven't been trusted to narrate their experiences? So there's a lot of areas where uh, it's it's thoughtful to consider, like, uh, what am I assuming about the experience of the person who's being asked to meet this obligation or in who is uh, having to, you know, work around whatever um, parameters and, and restrictions or requirements and are they, are they reasonable for everybody? Are there situations where this might be creating a hardship and is it necessary or is it just the way we've always been doing it? Because that's the reality is that we learn from other people and it might be that these policies and procedures were in place for people that work for. But if we're going to be expanding who we're serving, who we're doing business with, then we have to leave room for the fact that their experiences might be different and their needs might be different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's really powerful. This idea of asking yourself at the beginning of any sort of relationship, what am I assuming, right? What am I assuming about this person through the lens of my own experience and the way that I move through the world? Um, I think that's really powerful. Um, and another sort of question you write about in the book, I just lost it here in my document, but here it is. Um, you write when interacting with an indigenous community, and I think you could probably extend this to indigenous staff as well, but um, with an indigenous community, consider if the impetus is proactive, reactive, or extractive. Um, and uh, yeah, I wonder if you could just explain what you mean by those three different sort of categories. Yeah, so are you, it's it's good to be reflecting on like, why are you reaching out and building this relationship is it because you want to be able to in the future be able to work together on something you're being proactive you know that you're working in these people's territory and you know that there's opportunity in working together and you'd like to get to know your neighbors you're just popping by um eventually we might need to borrow a cup of sugar and we might have one to lend ourselves so um is this a proactive thing is it reactive 
Are you wanting to do something and you're realizing that you need consent? You need to perform a consultation because of a requirement um, in legislation? Uh, are you responding to something that's happening because there's been an issue? Uh, and and how does that inform the way that you're approaching community? How how are you acknowledging and and um, approaching a meeting with them? You know, if if they're aware that this is happening because you you need something or you want something or something went badly or you know there's something that that's expected to happen. Um, and to what extent could it be viewed as like transactional? Um, and then yeah, and then looking at extractive like is the intent to get something from this community uh, or, and how is that being approached? How is that interaction reflecting principles around like reciprocity? Like what are you, um, not like in a transactional way of like, you give me this, I give you that, but really looking at like, what are you bringing to the table in this relationship? Um, and, you know, if there's things that, that you're needing on an ongoing basis, how are you, you know, what are you looking, able to provide on an ongoing basis and how are you going to maintain that relationship, right? Like these are all different reasons why we might initiate, but if we're going to initiate it, like, how are you keeping this exercise of connecting and conversation from being a ticky box? And how are you going to kind of make sure that that relationship is embedded in your processes? How do you consult on things in the future? How do you plan to be present? How are you going to make time for your new connections? How often are you going to reach out? In what form? How are you going to gather? What are the ways that you're going to include your new partners? Um, how would they like to be included? How will you handle, you know, invitations to be included um, on, on their end? And and what is that going to look like? Uh, and so that's really kind of where I where I come from within terms of like assessing the impetus and then um, adjusting accordingly and, and being mindful of, of the intentionality of reaching out. Yeah. And for everyone watching, like Allison's book is full of these questions that you can literally write in your notebook and answer and like, yeah, just really practical, powerful um, questions that you can apply to your work. Um, I'm curious, Allison, like, I feel like there are these sort of themes of process and policy and like really formalizing things, but then also authenticity um, and making sure your reconciliation work is human and it's you and it's representative of you as a person. And how do you sort of balance these two? Because I feel like in the business world, the, the sort of idea of process and policy is very rigid and it's it's not very human. How do you find the, the sweet spot between those two? Um, I think it's important. It, like, it depends on how you look at policy, right? Do you look at it as a ceiling or a floor, right? Is this the minimum people can expect from you? At minimum, you are going to expect these things. These are the things that we're committing to. You have to do these things in order to get this action. But you always have room to surprise and delight, right? And so the policy can guide what it is that normally happens, but like just like um, the grad chair in our department talks about at school, like, um, you know, normally can work overtime, right? <laughs> so what are the times where we look at, like, what's the intent of the policy? You're hoping to make sure that all of your employees get what they need for their wellness. So if the policy says X, Y, and Z are available, and that was the goal, and somebody's asking for something that's like L or M, is it meeting the goal? that was what was the policy was for, right? So can it be expanded? Can we reimagine the scope? Can we leave language that gives flexibility for people to use their good judgment? If you've trusted people to join your organization, they're aligned with your values, they understand what your hope is in terms of providing whatever it is to whoever it is that this policy guides. How are you leaving room for people to use discretion in order to accommodate needs that you might not have been aware of when the policy was created, or that might now be an issue because of changes of circumstances, policy legislation, other external factors. 
um, and and just looking at that. So I think it's really just important to look at our like what's our relationship with the policy, mm. and how can we be creative? Yeah, yeah. Policy as a floor, not a ceiling, as a jumping off place to enable the more human work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to sort of circle back to a concept you talked about. Um, uh, earlier in the conversation around passing the mic. Um, and I think this is something a lot of, of, of businesses are looking to do, especially around this time of the year and looking to amplify voices. And what are your sort of your best practices for engaging with folks that you want to amplify or just that process of passing the mic? I think it's good to check in with people and just confirm like, I'd like to do this in order to draw attention to what's going on. You know, is that okay? Get consent. Um, let them know what to expect and what your intentions are, right? And make sure that the time is good. I've been in situations where, you know, I've wanted to highlight something really cool that's happened, but actually it's not a really good time for that attention for that community, right? They've just had a gravesite confirmation and they're engaged with um you know the process of grieving and the the cultural aspects of bringing people home and all sorts of things like that so really looking at like is this a good time for people to be getting additional attention are they able to engage um what kinds of support are you going to be able to provide to moderate that level of um, attention or engagement like is your audience one that's going to be supportive and helpful or is the attention going to make things more difficult mm -hmm. um right like if you're doing targeted ads to a demographic that doesn't necessarily that, that can leave a lot of really you know um undesirable um commentary or engagement um how are you contributing to making sure that um passing the mic isn't like making people busy or doing things that they did not want to do or possibly causing harm um, and then also like making sure that, you know, you're doing something that will actually be helpful, right? Like maybe don't tell people all about our barbecue because then we're going to end up to go and buy a lot more burgers, but please do tell them about, you know, bringing things down for the food hamper or, or whatever. So make sure that the thing that you're amplifying is something that is, um, that the organization wants amplified, um, to your specific audience or, um, look at how you can help resource the community to be able to boost their message to their own community. And like, that's another way of passing the mic is sharing resources so that people can, can do their own, own work and just really making sure that you're um, comfortable or that they're comfortable with how you plan to talk about their organization and what they do. Um, and that they, they know what to expect um, just so that everyone's clear and it can be a supportive, like positive experience of feeling like people are in contribution versus like a stressful situation where you're having to like re-explain yourself 20 times and then field comments from armchair quarterbacks who don't understand the way you live and what you do. And, and now you're just a lot busier and you're not doing the thing that you're intending to do. So yeah. that's, that's generally kind of how I suggest and, and look at who's endorsed by communities and who has um, support and is already doing the work. Uh, and and looking to be able to contribute to those established folks who have um, you know community trust and credibility, um, so that you're you're able to recognize um, people in in a way that shows situational awareness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've even read stories of like. Uh, someone with a really big audience or a business with a really big audience will point people toward like a really small grassroots organization and ask them to donate. And then they'll get this huge influx of money, which seems like a great thing, but they don't actually like, they're not set up to receive that or deal with all of that or process it. So um, yeah, just thinking, you know, and as you say, the, the, the answer to that is consent, like get the organization's consent to share their story, how you talk about it um, and, and how you suggest people interact with them. Um, yeah, we just have a couple of questions or a couple of minutes left, um, but just wanted to sort of end on the idea of, of scale and of ripple effects and, um, and how doing this work, even on a small scale is really, really important. Cause I'd imagine a lot of folks here today might be like solo entrepreneurs or freelancers or, um, you know, have a really small business or a startup and 
might be thinking, okay, I, I can't have a huge impact, but you write really beautifully about ripple effects in your book. And, and just what would you say to those folks who are um, thinking they can't have a big impact because they're too small? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, we we take the time to share with our audiences who we are and what we care about. And, you know, if they, they care enough to follow along our journey as business owners, then, you know, that's that's an aspect of your experience as a business owner that you can share also in terms of how you're meeting those, um, you know, the the items that the TRC has has suggested um, to move forward on. So, yeah, I mean, and you just don't know who you're inspiring. Maybe you don't have a lot of resources, but maybe in sharing your story, someone who has more can team up with you or can, you know, build on what it is that you're doing or participate uh, in a way to, to bring more attention to what it is that you're trying to do. Um, or even just to start reflecting on on starting their own journey, right? Like you don't know who's watching and who's going to be inspired. And then also looking at like, well, what does that mean to community, right? In terms of your audience or your staff, like what's the experience of, you know, feeling felt and heard, right? And and really that's, you know, that's integral to building a relationship is feeling like people know that you exist they understand that you have challenges and that they care enough about it to, to do something about it, or at least to share with people so that they can also move towards doing something about it. So I think, you know, we really shouldn't underestimate the power of, of an individual. Look at all of the things that you're building every single day, right? And think about all of the ways that, you know, even just, you know, smiling at people in a store, right? Like, when your experience might be that in a retail establishment, people are following you around. They're looking to see if you're shoplifting something. They're making assumptions about who you are because of how you look. When you take that time even just to see people as humans and make them feel welcome, right? That's, that's a good feeling. That's going to encourage, you know, them to tell people like, this is a safe place to shop, right? This is a safe place to be. And also, you know, it's, it's a nice thing for them to be able to carry through their day as well and to be able to move forward having felt seen having felt comfortable and to be able to focus on the next thing and not you know a difficult experience they've had with some overly aggressive loss prevention officer or something right like could there's indigenous people have enough to do without having to <laughs> stress about that so how can you lessen the burden um by helping people feel seen and helping people access the things that they need in a way that is comfortable um, so that they can get on with all the other things that are important to them. Yeah, that's a really beautiful note to end on. Um, Allison, thank you so much for all of this. This has been a really amazing conversation. And I hope everyone has taken notes and learned so much. Um, I, I know that I have. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be able to be in conversation with you. I have a lot of respect for what you do. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. And back to you, Jenna, to, to go into this next portion of networking. Well, I am fangirling over both of you. So I am so grateful that both of you took the time today to have this conversation together and to be in this community. And, you know, if you haven't already gotten Allison's book, we are giving away five copies of it. So you can um, take our post event survey. The link will be in the chat. And that is how you enter to win this. And, you know, it's it's not a thick read, but like what Kylie's saying is it's got such great reflection prompts in here for you and your business. And it's just like an incredible read that's not going to take you, you know, your whole life to get through. Right. It's very accessible. So I can't recommend this enough. After reading this book, I was like, we have to have this conversation today. So, you know, thank you so much, Allison, for coming here. Thank you, Kylie, for, you know, diving in and developing these such important questions for people to answer. 